In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground. Firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay. Light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Good evening. We're studying this evening in lesson number 95 uh, the ten lepers. This is found in Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 37, if you want to follow along, if you don't have the book. What page is the... 352. Page 352 in the workbook. <coughs> Luke 17, 11 through 37. Here we're told it came to pass as they were on the way to Jerusalem that he was passing along the borders of Samaria and Galilee. Coming back from Galilee heading toward uh, the city of Jerusalem, uh, heading toward the time of the Passover, uh, we're told that as he was on the border, uh, he was uh, entering into a certain village. There met him ten men that were lepers who stood afar off. Now these lepers generally would not have been in the town. And under the law of Moses, they would have been required uh, to... Uh, keep their distance, and they would had to have notified anyone to whom they came into uh, close association with or would have that they indeed were lepers so that uh, 
they might know that and that they might take precautions not to interact. Being a leper was a, a terrible thing in and of itself. But since the leper was seen as unclean under the law of Moses, that put them in a position where uh, in many ways they were worse off than the publicans and the sinners. Uh, they were literally true outcasts. And there were more people that I would imagine we could have been cataloged as publicans and sinners than lepers. And so that kept one from marriage unless they married a, another leper. It kept them from all types of situations and circumstances. Uh, they weren't in the temple. They weren't in the synagogue. And so it, it was a very difficult thing uh, to be a leper and to live that kind of life. And so in many places we find what uh, some have called leper colonies or groups of lepers who would live together so that they might have some type of community, that they might have someone to talk to, someone occasionally to sit down and eat a meal with, uh, without being uh, treated as an outcast. And so while they may have been an outcast on the fringe of society, among themselves they were a community of their own. And so we see that there uh, met him ten men who were lepers, and of course they stood afar off. They, according to the law of Moses, uh, we can see here in Leviticus 13, 45, 46 is a reference that we have there. I'm not going to take time to turn and read it. We've talked about uh, lepers before. But uh, they had to maintain a strict distance so that there were no accidents. And so not only was a leper... Uh, outcast from society as a, as a general rule, but they also had the responsibility of everybody that they came close to or that someone was coming toward them uh, to say, you know, leper, or leper, unclean, unclean, you know, to warn the people. And again, they would either, uh, the lepers would have to either move or uh, the others uh, fearing the disease, uh, would have uh, tried to uh, remove themselves. And so uh, it's uh, been debated about leprosy, what exactly it was. Was it just one thing or was it a combination of several skin disorders? But we do know that the words of the uh, the disease of leprosy caused a failure of circulation uh, starting first in the extremities. And many times it started in the fingers and the toes and perhaps the end of your, your nose and ears where uh, circulation is, is not that great. Uh, and, and as it closed off the circulation to those smaller uh, type of blood vessels. Uh, sadly, uh, people's ears and nose and fingers and toes uh, would just begin to fall off uh, because of the lack of circulation. And so uh, it, it was, uh, at least some of the forms were caused by uh, a uh, infection, a disease that uh, managed to enter into the body. However, some debate that there were some things that were described as leprosy that weren't uh, contagious and couldn't be caught. Like uh, I mean, it basically produced the the result of that. I mean, it was a it it was a very well, slow. 
I mean, a lot of it, you know, when you get frostbite on your fingers and your toes, you know, they'll turn black and they'll just, you know, the most time today, if it lose circulation, can't restore it, they'll amputate. Uh, but in, in that time, due to the lack of uh, circulation, you know, they wouldn't necessarily spread like gangrene. Now, gangrene, if you get it in one part of the body, it's sort of a blood born poison and so it scatters the infection throughout your whole body but leprosy is a more long-term very slow agonizing kind of thing and so it could vary anywhere from the white spots on your skin uh, places where the, the skin uh, would turn white uh, become flaky scaly that kind of thing uh, but Beyond that, it, like I said, it could rob you of your fingers, uh, toes, uh, outer kind of digits and all. And then beyond that, uh, you could very well start losing your feet and hands. And and so it, it was uh, a very terrible thing. And I'm sure that for people who knew of it and had family and had it seen individuals, uh, it was a very terrible thing. Some places they used to have, uh, and I don't know how far back that goes, but they used to have leper colonies. There were places where the lepers would live. Uh, those who could uh, tried to either raise food or whatever, but then uh, in those places there were individuals who would bring them food as an act of charity or kindness. They wouldn't directly interact with them, but there would be a place where uh, they could put the food and then the lepers would, after they departed, come and get uh, the basket. It was real contagious, wasn't it? Uh, some forms of it, yes. I mean, it, it was something that, uh, you know, again, uh, you had to get the the infection in your your body and i'm not really sure of the mechanism by which uh, that started years ago i you know and i had read that you know it it, in, it it enters the body some way now i don't know if that's because of a cut or something that is exposed to the to the virus i don't know if the virus lives outside of the body and if somebody touched something I mean, by the way, the Bible describes it. it there, the lepers were pretty much put in a, in in what today would be uh, a excluded quarantine kind of situation uh, because of the, uh, the the fear of it, no doubt. But uh, you know, apparently, some forms could be. Well, like I said, there's various discussions as to what biblical leprosy actually was. Some say that it, there was a specific disease that was leprosy, and then there are others that say that there's a whole group of things, uh, just like psoriasis or other things that can cause a white, scaly, flaky kind of skin condition, which could be confused with Leprosy, and therefore maybe some who were not proper properly what we would think of as suffering from the disease were misdiagnosed, and so because of those spots and patches and and all of that, were relegated to to being treated uh, as a leper. This, this, uh, these, these, these ordinances were put in place. Yeah. It's saying that it's Skilliness and flaky, and also it says, uh, well, it just says scaly there too. Yeah. So it takes you to three different. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like I said, there, there's there, ultimately you had to go, you know, if you felt that you were cured, you know, if you had something that was diagnosed as leprosy or believed to be leprosy. And then somewhere along the way, it went away. 
uh, you know, there are conditions and circumstances under the law of Moses whereby they had to uh, go to the priest and the priest would look at them and if they truly were, the priest knew how to diagnose this. And uh, apparently that was part of the, 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 the things, duties given to the priest. But show yourself to the priest and if the priest declared them to be clean, then there was an offering and washing and various things to, uh, to reestablish them uh, as pure or whole or however they wanted to look at it in society. Uh, it's a terrible thing. I mean, it, I mean we, we all know what it felt like during COVID uh, you know, to be in a situation where you, know, you had to stay in the house, you weren't supposed to get within six feet of people, you weren't supposed to shake hands, you weren't supposed to have you know, uh, public dinners, those kind of things where people would be handling the same utensils, the serving spoons and, and all of that. We got just a small taste of it. I'm not saying it. Well, that, that was a part of going to the priest. If they went, when they went to the priest and the priest declared them to be clean, then they, could be, they would be washed in the mick for the baptistry and they would be declared clean. Now, I would imagine that the priest would probably have furnished, I'm, I'm again not a priest and that wasn't my point, but uh, I would imagine that the priest would have given them something to state or show some token something that uh, that they were to be back because the, the law of Moses clearly states that I mean if you think you're well you can't decide that on your own and uh, if the doctor the physician has been treating you or may have been treating you says I, I think that you're you're well you still had to go to the priest and so there was an a official recognition that had to be given by the priesthood before you could uh, be. You, you just didn't wander back off in society because, you know, the question would be, have the priest, uh, have you been to the priest? Has a priest looked at that? And if you said, no, but the doctor said, I'm okay, it's like, no, that's not how it works. And so there, there were certain rules and they lifted up their voice, not only, I'm sure, declaring that they were lepers, but also saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Jesus healed uh, many who were sick and afflicted with various uh, illnesses. Uh, and of course, of late, He had raised the dead. Uh, and so... Uh, as a desperate leper and Jesus was in the area, you have absolutely nothing to lose to seek Jesus out and uh, ask Him for mercy that He might heal them. And we're told when He saw them, uh, said unto them, Go and show yourselves unto the priests. Now this is part of that law that we're saying this is kind of interesting because they are lepers they've not been clean cleansed healed whatever jesus first tells them go show yourselves to the priests and then we're told and it came to pass as they went they were cleansed and so it's that's kind of an interesting uh, circumstance you you would think that you're kind of putting the cart at, uh, before the horse because uh, I mean we would think that Jesus would have cleansed them first healed them uh, and then told them to go to the priest but he says go show yourself the priest which would have required uh, either going to Jerusalem or there were Levitical cities in the various territories and areas where the Levites lived so they could have presented themselves wherever uh, the Levites uh, were 
where there was a, a priest that was living. Uh, but it's interesting that he first tells them to go show themselves to the priests. They haven't been healed. So, uh, you know, again, they turn to go. They leave to go. And it doesn't really time-wise tell us uh, whether this happened as soon as they turned and left. It's a very non-descriptive term, really. It says, uh, and it came to pass, which would seem to imply that there is some time. Maybe not, but it came to pass as they went. Seems like they were moving <coughs> in the direction of the priests. Uh, they were healed. And of course, if you had leprosy, you would know uh, when there were substantial changes uh, to know that you were healed. And it, it's interesting that in verse 15, it says, one of them, when he saw that he was ha uh, healed, turned back, glorifying God and fell upon his face at his, that's Jesus' feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. Now, don't know about all the others specifically, but in this particular case, we have someone who is a Samaritan, uh, and this Samaritan came back and fell down at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. And so we get a glimpse into some of the uh, relations that Jesus had with the Samaritans, though he didn't spend a great deal of time uh, with the Samaritans. We do see in, in John 4 that he spent time uh, with the Samaritan uh, people when he met the woman at the well and came into the city. He also passed through on some other occasions and interacted with people. And so a knowledge or a an understanding of who Jesus was, at least in the sense that he could do these miracles and he was a great teacher and you know he he may have been the Messiah. You know those, those were all the things that uh, Jesus uh, had had made known to them uh, previous to this. And so this individual who was a Samaritan came and fell down uh, in at the feet of Jesus. And of course, if we take for granted what the lady said at the well, uh, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans and the Samaritans had uh, likewise not many dealings with the Jews and they tended to uh, stay away from one another. It's, it's interesting that this account that we have here uh, was written by Luke. Who was Luke? He was a doctor. Uh, it's, it's interesting that uh, Luke, uh, you know, is, is writing this account and, you know, Jesus didn't say, Luke, come over here and take a look at this and, and heal them and do they. He sent them as the law of Moses required but it's interesting that, that Luke is the only one that really gives us an account of this. And I'm sure that being a physician, it was something that uh, took his uh, attention uh, because, uh, again, there really didn't seem to be a lot. I'm sure there was lots of doctors who put forth cures for leprosy, but... Uh, as far as I'm aware, there hasn't been really any true medical advances and treatments for leprosy except in the last 100, 150 years, something like that, when we started getting antibiotics and, and all of that, maybe the last 100 years that they've been able to uh, treat leprosy, uh, have a uh, antibiotic or whatever that that can attack the disease. And so this Samaritan come and he turned back and was glorifying God, fell at his feet, giving him thanks. And then Jesus answering said, were not the ten cleansed? 
But where are the nine? You know, sometimes we are so happy about things that we forget to be thankful. Uh, you know, I'm sure you, we could say, well, Jesus told them to go to the priest, and so they were going to the priest. He didn't tell them to come back. He said, go to the priest. So in some people's minds, the other nine uh, may have thought, well, you know, we, we, we're, we're supposed to go to the priest. That's what they did. Of course, uh, in that, it showed a certain lack of, of, of care in the sense of being thankful. And so when you kind of look at that, there were 10 uh, that were healed. 100% was healed, but only 10%, just one of them, turned around and came back to offer thanks. I, I sometimes think about, you know, we uh, Christians, we, we pray on a daily basis. We talk to God about our cares, our concerns, our worries, all the different things that are going on. Um, and so again, just like the lepers, we're, we're all eager to share that with God. But then at the same time, when prayers are answered, uh, when whatever it is we don't want to happen doesn't happen or that we want to happen does happen, whatever the, the case may be, um, you know, are we more like the nine? We just go on our way uh, and you know, again, whenever we need something else, we'll come back or are we like the tenth one that turned around and came back and gave thanks and praise and glory to God as well as Jesus worshipped Him uh, it's, it's something to think about. Uh, again, this account is in here for a reason. It's not just here uh, for taking up space in Luke's letter. And so um, through the Holy Spirit's bringing these things to Luke's remembrance, uh, we can be prompted to ask ourselves exactly how thankful uh, we are for the things you know in the in the beginning of the day Jesus taught his disciples what seems to be a, a morning prayer to pray give us this day our daily bread uh, as we sit down to eat it do we give thanks for it I mean we ask for it now we've got it but how many just sit down and start eating and uh, maybe later think about offering thanks. But uh, Jesus was questioning not the one who returned, but he was questioning uh, the care. Nine others wanted mercy, and mercy was shown to them. Um, and they may have in their own way been thankful but we have to also remember that there's a difference between being happy and being thankful and then thanking God. That's a whole different thing. When something we pray for happens and we're excited and we're happy about it, uh, you know, in one way we're, we're just so glad, we're thankful that, that we got that, but are we really thankful enough to take that to the point where we actually go back to God and say, uh, thank you so much for, you know, I ask for it and thank you for giving it to me. I ask that it not happen. Thanks for, you know, it, it coming back, that medical test, whatever it is, you know, when you, I think we've, most of us have been through medical tests and you know, you ask, well, how did it look? And, of course, the person doing the test says, well, we can't really make any comments about it. The doctor has to look at the X-ray, the MRI, whatever it is. Uh, and so they, they're not very straightforward. And uh, they take a blood test, and it's like, when will that be back? And they say things like, well, you know, it, it, it'll take a few days. We'll give you a call when it, when it comes back. And so, you know, Again, we have those, those kind of situations. And so with what Jesus is showing us here, what Luke is showing us, uh, you know, a lot of people 
are interested in God getting involved in their lives, but not as many, we see from this, are as interested in being thankful uh, when those things happen. Now, I'm sure tonight, if in keeping with the law of Moses, they went, uh, they presented themselves to the priest, they uh, made whatever offering they needed to make, they were immersed in the mikvah, as a, as a spiritual cleansing, washing, uh, and they were just delighted and happy, I'm sure. Uh, just like when we're baptized for the remission of our sins, I'm sure when they came out of the mikvah, uh, all that old stuff was behind them. They were delighted and excited, but uh, you know they may have been thankful in their own way, but they failed to thank the one who did it and uh, to give glory as it happened. That thing turned out good. Yeah, and and the interesting thing as we is there something going on? So, if the roof's going to fall in, please tell me. Okay. Uh, it, it's interesting that they were on the border of Samaria and Galilee. And I don't know, again, it doesn't really give us the percentages, but some of them, it would seem to imply, were uh, Galileans or those who uh, were Jewish. And so Jesus wants to know where the other nine are. And he says, save this stranger uh, to the Israelites. He would have been a stranger or there would have been, you know, this this separation between them. But he eagerly comes back. But uh, some of those apparently were fellow Jews and they didn't come back to even be thankful to a fellow Jew. Uh, and he told him, Arise and go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole. Of course, uh, he would uh, have had to still go to the priest and uh, do the necessary things. But um, his faith, their faith, all of them were healed. They had faith to come. And, um, you know, I, I doubt that the other nine lost their healing. Uh, it's just their, their focus was on something different. But this one man... Uh, and again, I, I can't imagine what it would be like to live your life as an outcast and how, how truly thankful you would be to be delivered. Yes, sir. Is there any, anything to the thought that he, uh, or was this a certain reason why he would point out that that cow was a foreigner? Well, I, I think the, the main issue is, is that he was a Samaritan. He was a stranger uh, in a way. He, uh, he would have kind of been thought of more as a Gentile, but they were kind of half and half. But, you know, he, it, there were apparently some of them who were Jews, and none of them came back except this one man. Now, there may have been other Samaritans in there, and there may have been Jews in there. Nine were clean, but the only this one man who uh, would not have had a great deal, not as much knowledge as a Jew would have been of Jesus and the things uh, which he was doing. And, you know, there are those, I'm sure, that want uh, the, the faith healers look at this and say, well, it had nothing to do with Jesus. It was their faith that made them whole. And, you know, if, if, if they didn't have faith, if they hadn't turned and went, they wouldn't have got healed as if Jesus couldn't have healed them without them turning and going first. No, they may have... I, I got the new King James. You got the King James? No, this is the American Standard Version. Does it say foreigner or stranger? Or what it, say? it says stranger in the... Yeah, well, the King James says stranger too. Is so. <coughs> that what he's what he's for? Is stranger? Uh, I mean, I mean uh, King James... I, I don't I, I don't have the King James in front of me, so I, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm working off of this American Standard Version here. 
But again, foreigner, stranger, it's still, uh, the meaning is, is pretty much the same. It's that kind of a, I mean, both of them have the same kind of. In the King James, a stranger. Okay. Then things kind of take a turn, and that's kind of part of this. The the second part, uh, it says, and being asked by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God cometh, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For lo, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, this is one of those verses that you shouldn't be able to misunderstand. Where is the kingdom of heaven? Right now. Yeah, where, where does this say that the kingdom of God is? Yeah, it's, it's the people. It's within us. It is the Holy Spirit through the Word of God working with us. When we are Christians, when we are born again, uh, First uh, Colossians, the first chapter, verse 13 says, we're translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Now the Pharisees asked this question, when will the kingdom come? Now, it had been and still continues to be something that the Jewish leadership, including the Pharisees and others, had greatly desired that the Messiah would come back, that he would set up his earthly kingdom, he would reign on the throne of David, his father. And so in the midst of all of this and in the midst of probably their plotting and planning and sneaking around and doing all the things that they tended to do, they ask him a specific question. When the kingdom of God uh, would come? Now, what they're asking pretty much is, can you give us a date? I mean, are we talking about in our lifetime are we talking about in four or five lifetimes? Are we talking about in the next month? Are you talking about what? Uh, throughout Jesus' teaching and in this particular section that we're looking at, there's a lot of, of these parables that begin with the statement, the kingdom of heaven is like. We see that a lot. Kingdom of heaven is like the kingdom of heaven is, is like uh, John the Baptist comes saying that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Jesus began preaching saying the kingdom of heaven was at hand. He sent his disciples out, uh, the the twelve and the seventy and and others, no doubt, saying the same thing. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, if it's at hand, when when is it going to get here? Uh, I mean, what what is the defining moment of the kingdom. Now, here Jesus is probably as, as clear as in many ways He ever was in talking specifically about the kingdom of heaven. Um, lots of people could think many different things. You know, blessed is He that eateth and drinketh with you in the kingdom and and James and John wanted to sit on the right and the left hand when uh, the kingdom came. When, when the, and so the Pharisees just want an answer. Uh, and of course, uh, one of the things that happens is if you give them a date, time, place, whatever, of course they knew that the place, it would start in Jerusalem, but you know, if He gave them a time, a date, whatever, a day, if that didn't come to pass, then they could uh, clearly charge him as being a false prophet. You know, we have many false prophets today. It seems like every time there's a full moon, there's two moons in a month. Every time there's an asteroid shower, every time, 
you know, Saturn's visible. Somebody comes up with a prophecy that they figured something out from the scriptures. Jesus will be here, you know, next week in three days, whatever. Uh, and so people have been, even before all of this, trying to come to a conclusion about the kingdom. But in this particular instance, Jesus makes it very clear. And He says, when the kingdom cometh, uh, it will not be with observation. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there. The kingdom of God is within you. And when... The Founding Fathers signed the Declaration of Independence uh, as the colonies of the United States of America. You know, at that point in time, you could look at a map and you could say, here is the United States of America. Now, it wasn't there before, but... A king of England can get all red-faced and pound his fist on his table and look at a map, and, and there is what they're calling the United States. It's, it's came with observation. We, we can trace it to this river. We can trace it to that boundary. Uh, we can, can map it out. But Jesus said when the kingdom of heaven comes, it's not going to be an observable kingdom. And by that, he says, you're not going to be able to say that the boundary starts over there and it ends over here. And everything between these mountains or whatever, this, this is the start of the kingdom of God. Jesus didn't even go so far as to say, well, you know, the kingdom would come with the obs observance of the Holy Spirit in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, even though there were cloven tongues of fire and things that happened on the day of Pentecost when Peter uh, began to talk about it, it's in that day, those people went back to their houses and as far as a map was concerned, on the day of Pentecost, nothing changed. Well, I mean, the kingdom of heaven is where God reigns. Jesus reigns over His people. And again, if there is a sinner and a Christian standing side by side, the kingdom is with the Christian, but that's the kingdom of Satan standing beside them. And so the kingdom is made up of those who are either under uh, God's rule and reign, are those who are under the rule and reign of the God of this world, uh, which is Satan. And so uh, they were all gathered there in one place in Jerusalem, but I don't know where they went that night after uh, you know, they went back to their houses, homes, different cities. Um, you, know, you could say that technically the church was you know, in that city or in that place because there was at least one person there but, but in reality, nothing changed on a map. And that's the important part. Uh, the nation of Israel didn't change. There was still Galilee, Samaria, Judea. Uh, nothing changed on a map. There isn't all of a sudden uh, a line drawn somewhere that says, you know, this is the kingdom of God. Uh, this is God's kingdom. This is the kingdom of the Messiah versus Rome. Nothing changed on a, a physical map. Uh, and so this is the clearest point uh, that uh, Jesus ever talks about the kingdom in the actual sense that it's not a physical, territorial earthly kind of thing. The, the kingdom of heaven extends from earth into heaven itself. Hebrews 12 tells us that 
we are now part of the kingdom of, of heaven. We are coming to Mount Zion. Uh, we're, we're a part of that. Uh, John tells us that he's made us kings and priests in the Revelation letter. Uh, and so we, we have that, that whole discussion uh, that... Yeah. Uh, I mean, when Jesus speaks to Pilate and Pilate asks him about the kingdom, he says, my kingdom's not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my disciples would be basically beating down your door right now because you arrested me. Uh, you know, and then... Uh, Pilate asked him, well, are you a king then? He said, that's the purpose I came for, to be a king. But it's not of this world. And so to Pilate, he explains that it's not a territorial. Pilate did not feel that Rome was in any way endangered by Christ, uh, what we would think of as Christianity. Uh, Pilate was happy to turn him loose, tried to turn him loose. Um, he, sadly, he just didn't. Um, draw the line with the Jews and say, I'm, I can do this and so I'm going to do it. Uh, he caved in. But Pilate knew he was no threat. Uh, Jesus wasn't trying to create some earthly kingdom. Uh, he says, The day will come when you shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you shall not see it. Now, if Jesus had any intention of reigning uh, on the throne of David in Jerusalem, if that was his plan, then you could have went to uh, and, and applied for an audience to the king uh, of Israel uh, at any, any given time if Jesus was reigning on an earthly throne. But Jesus said the day, the time will come, of course, when Jesus has ascended back uh, to the Father after the resurrection, after all of those, uh, many people will desire to see uh, many people will be aware of the fact that they missed the boat. And as we see, starting on the day of Pentecost and going forward, uh, the priests and many others believed and obeyed, but they didn't get to have audience with Jesus. Uh, they were added by the Lord to the church, and as such, they were made a part of the kingdom of heaven. But it wasn't like the days when Jesus was walking on earth, when He was healing and doing all of those things which the lepers had come for. Uh, and so uh, talks about the return, the coming back of the Son of Man. And uh, as our time kind of runs out, go down to 26, He says, and it, it talks about... Uh, uh, the days of Noah, uh, so or even so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. That's when He finally comes again. Talk about the days of Noah. They ate, they drank, they married, they were given in marriage until the day which Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, even as it come to pass in the days of Lot. Of course, uh, the angels came. The, the angels took Lot and his wife, two daughters, out of the city. That's all they were able uh, to save, and God rained judgment down upon them. Uh, and so we, we see this sudden coming. And Jesus, besides talking about the fact that the kingdom of heaven uh, you know, would not come with observation, without physical markers, without being able to give surveyors a job resurveying the kingdom. He also talks about his return, talking about the coming of the Son of Man. And just as much as they were asking him specifically about uh, this date time thing for the, the coming of the kingdom, uh, it would come when it would would get there, so to speak. We'll be there when we get there. But he also talks about the coming of the Son ultimately in judgment. 
And he makes it clear even in that, against what people still say today, he makes it very clear that the coming of the Son of Man will be like in the days of Noah. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He preached repentance and for people to turn to God while the ark was preparing. He was preaching for the world to repent while he was preparing an ark to save those who were willing to be saved. And so he preached, he built. He preached, he drove some more nails, whatever he did. Uh, and so right up until the day when the heavens opened up, you know, the animals came to Noah, he put them on the ark, God sealed the ark, the heavens opened up, the rains came, and and you know, sadly the day that the rain started, people were planning on weddings, they were talking about the harvest they needed to make, they were talking about the plants they needed to plant, whatever it was. Uh, and that day was the last day. And so all of those things were uh, destroyed. And so you know, he talks about uh, what some might think of as the rapture in verse 34. Uh, two will be in one bed, one will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the grinding wheel, one will be taken, one will be left. These things will happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, and so again, uh, they ask, where, Lord, where, where will all of this happen? And he just says that where the body is, there will the eagles also be gathered, the scavengers. And so uh, it, it will happen at a time that they knew not and at a place of course, the, the whole heavens and earth will pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt uh, with fervent heat. It's interesting. Do what? Yeah. It's interesting again, uh, Brother McGarvey points out in here that uh, when Jesus was talking about that, he, he had knowledge and he shared the knowledge that day and night happened simultaneously on the earth. Because he said there'd be two people in bed. That implies night and sleeping. One would be taken, one would be left. But then there would be two women at a, gr uh, a grinding wheel, grinding. One would be taken, one would be left. And so uh, that's, yeah. And so you, you have that, that kind of situation. And, you know, at the time it may have seemed a little ridiculous to them, but today as we understand the globe of the earth, we know that, you know, just like it's 8 o'clock here, almost 8 o'clock, uh, it's 8 o'clock in the morning somewhere else, and it's everywhere in between. Night and day, and of course, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, I've when, when we do the, the program, uh, if you've seen it live, usually when I come on the, the program on Monday, I usually tell them good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are and whenever you are, because you know we've got people in the Philippines, we've got people in India, we've got people in Africa, we've got people in the United States, and so some are running behind me in time and some are ahead of me at time. It's actually 7 o'clock in in India when we start the program on Monday morning uh, and it's um, it's it's about 930 in the night in the Philippines and so it you know where, wherever you are whenever you are and of course we record it and so some people aren't seeing it until some other day and some other time but uh, in Christ's return in that moment in that twinkling of an eye uh, some will be taken and some will be left. And of course, Hebrews 9.27 says it's appointed unto men once to die and then the judgment. If we're uh, like Enoch, we may, if we're alive when Jesus comes, we won't die, but we will be transformed. We will be translated as He was. Some will be translated into eternal life and some will be translated into eternal destruction. Why not make this the day that you and your family seek out the Church of Christ in your community? 
we encourage you to attend one of our worship times, or Bible studies. God's grace, truth, and salvation, is truly worth finding and knowing. May God bless and keep you, as we walk together in His truth. And remember as always, the Churches of Christ salute you. Our new programs are posted to Facebook and YouTube on Thursday afternoon, and they should be available for viewing by 7 p.m. We also encourage our viewers to visit our website at www.thechurchesofchrist.life. We ask that you like us on Facebook and share our programs. On YouTube please share and subscribe for notifications. This program was pre-recorded.